This year's international draft class might not be getting as much buzz, but one name definitely worth watching is Rocco Perkacin. This is Florence Ceiling. Let's break him down. Croatian forward Rocco Perkacin is one of the youngest prospects in the 2021 NBA draft, not turning 19 until late November. Perkacin has been playing pro since the age of 16, but it seems like the time has come for the Croatian forward to leave his country and explore the NBA. At 6'9", 220 pounds with a 6'11 wingspan, Perkacin has the measurements to play either front court spot. But beyond his size and strength, it is his ability with the ball and flashes of stretching the floor and playmaking that make Perkacin someone to watch. The first thing that sets Perkacin apart from most other prospect bigs is his ball handling. Perkacin has flashed legit ball skills during his professional career in Croatia. He is a threat in grab-and-go situations, meaning that he can collect the defensive rebound and then launch the fast break by himself. Perkacin is a solid ball handler at 6'9", and although he still needs to keep working on his handle, he can get the job done in the open court. Perkacin picks up speed as he goes, and once he gets to the rack, he is strong enough to displace defenders and finish at the basket. Here, he gets the late ISO, creates the contact going right, and calmly finishes. Even when Perkacin is not finishing, his potential to drive with the ball means that defenses have to scramble. Here, he brings the ball up, and then finds the pass for the easy drive. Of course, he will need to keep developing this skill. The flashes are tasty, but the consistency is improvable. For instance, Perkacin is fairly fluid going left here, but gets stripped. Or here, he sets up the ISO drive, tries to play through contact, but misses the shot. Right now, the tools are there. The ball handling, the size, the willingness to embrace contact, but Perkacin needs to do a better job putting them together. In terms of self-creation, his glimpses are not limited exclusively to drives. The Croatian forward has a little bit of sauce off the dribble or in the half court in general. Perkacin is not going to break his man down off the dribble for 10 seconds and pull up, but he is not limited to being a catch and finish big. For instance, Perkacin can flash into spaces and pull up off one or two dribbles. He also has a clever turnaround shot that he puts to good effect given his high release point and touch. You can watch that in effect here. There have even been some wilder flashes, such as the step back 3 off the dribble. Perkacin is also comfortable operating down low. As I will get into shortly, one important thing to note is that he does not mind playing through contact. But beyond that, he does genuinely have soft touch on his moves. Perkacin can bump down low and then get into little push shots or short fadeaways close to the basket. He plays with a mixture of physicality and finesse that is impressive for an 18 year old. I don't expect him to become a post-up big, but it's nice to see that he has moves that he can fall back on if needed. This fadeaway against Split is a good example of what Perkacin can do. Like I said, Perkacin does not mind getting dirty. At 220 pounds with wide shoulders, Perkacin has a strong frame that I have no worries about in the NBA from a strength perspective. Perkacin can take bumps, absorb contact, and embrace physicality. He does not mind getting into someone's chest, which is always good to see for a big that is so young. Perkacin is able to get himself open to receive the ball and then carve out space using his body, or he can also operate as a screener in pick and roll situations. Perkacin is a solid jumper off of two feet who can get up, displace his opponent, and then get the shot he wants at the rim. But more than anything, I just like how Perkacin embraces contact. It is also worth noting that Perkacin is honestly a fairly good vertical athlete. He will not be on highlight reels every night, but Perkacin can elevate, especially when he gets ahead of steam. If you let Perkacin build up momentum, he can get up and get some big dunks for his team. Watch here as Perkacin cuts, gets the ball, and rises up for the flush. Or here, Perkacin uses the back screen to get up for the lob. Once again, it's the same thing here, but he gets fouled going up because he is a threat. I really like that Perkacin has this explosiveness and versatility in his arsenal because it allows him to play in a wider variety of offensive roles. Perkacin can also fill in as a floor spacer. He made 39% of his 3-pointers in the Adriatic League, taking a trifecta of triples per game. 
His mechanics are a little slow, and he can sometimes kick his legs out, but Perkacin once again has soft touch, and he gets good rotation on his shot. If Perkacin is on the three-point line, you have to respect his shot and close out on him. Ideally, you hope that Perkacin will be able to put together being an outside threat with his flashes of being able to handle the ball and drive to the basket. Right now, Perkacin is mostly limited to being a spot-up or pick-and-pop three-point shooter, although there have been a few glimpses of pull-ups that are worth monitoring. Looking to the future, I do believe in his shot. Perkacin will not remain in the high 30s, but I think that even shooting 32 or 33% from 3 will be good enough for his role. And the important thing for Perkacin, like I said, is that he can keep defenses honest. To some degree, he projects as a real floor spacer, and in the NBA, that is important for bigs. However, it is far from certain how Perkacin's 3-point shot will develop. There are some good signs, but there are also some bad ones. For instance, he shot 39% from deep this season, but it might be an outlier. Perkacin has never shot the ball that well before. On top of that, his free throw percentage, which can sometimes be indicative of how three-pointers might develop, has always been pretty poor. This year, Perkacin only made 65% of his foul shots in the Adriatic League, a figure similar to most of his career. Perkacin has the touch to make threes, but his prep and release is quite slow, and his legs can kick out sometimes. When the margins get tighter and quicker in the NBA, I'm not sure that he will be able to get his shot off as easily. I still buy the projection, but it could potentially be some time before teams let him space the floor and regularly shoot threes. On top of that, it's important to emphasize that Perkacin's flashes of self-creation, both from deep and pulling up closer to the basket, are very intermittent. Perkacin is still fairly rigid off the dribble, even if he can get the job done from time to time. He should really not be relied on to create his own shot at this point in his career. The few signs we've seen of this are worth pointing out, because if they can really be fleshed out, then that evidently vastly increases Perkacin's upside. However, I'm not sure how likely it is that Perkacin will ever be asked to create off the dribble on a nightly basis. Perkacin must also get better and craftier attacking off the catch. There is clear potential with his driving game, but it is fairly one-dimensional right now. Perkacin is limited as a straight-line driver who is not overly adept at changing directions or speeds. If you contain the drive, then you should be good because Perkacin is unlikely to bust out sidesteps, euro steps, or anything of the like. There is also room for improvement down low, where again, Perkacin is not the most creative player. He cannot constantly create space for himself, which leaves him fading away on most occasions. I'm not too worried about this since he is only 18, but we do have to track how Perkacin develops. On one hand, he could become a resourceful big that can drive, post, and shoot, but there is also a universe in which Perkacin does not master any of those areas and does not establish himself in any role. Luckily, Perkacin also has his passing to fall back on. He flashed playmaking chops in the Adriatic League that I expect to translate in the NBA. Perkacin is able to survey the floor and make decisions that give his team the advantage. He stood out to me the most as a post-passer who could read defenses and see over the top of them, such as here with this pass. But Perkacin is pretty steady and creative overall in the half court. Even when he's not going to work down low, for example, all of these skip passes are worth noting. The execution could feature better accuracy right into the shooting pockets, but I am encouraged that Perkacin is making these reads to begin with. He is generating open corner threes, even though he still needs some ironing. Watch here as Perkacin picks up the loose ball and instantly recognizes the right pass. Rebounding wise, it's a mixed bag right now. It's important for bigs to gather rebounds, so Perkacin's average of 7 boards per game is not too bad. Occasionally, he can crash the offensive glass or get his own misses, and obviously he will always have a size advantage relative to most players. But I also don't get the impression that Perkacin dominates the glass. His vertical pop is not the same of a standstill and his motor can fluctuate. Perkacin has the strength and enough athleticism to make a difference in the rebounding department, but he does not always use these tools. Perkacin's defense pretty much starts and ends with his lateral mobility. This is what I am most worried about and it will be a big obstacle to overcome in the NBA. When Perkacin is put into ball screen action, he lacks the foot speed and lateral quickness to make a difference. In these clips, he finds it hard to step out, guard the screen, and then recover to his original man in time to prevent the drive at the basket. If Perkacin is asked to switch, then he also struggles. 
Here, it's too much to ask him to keep up with the ball handler on the drive, and he ends up fouling. One area where Petkacin's bad lateral mobility really stands out is on his closeouts. Petkacin is often late or just flat out ineffective getting out to his attacker. He is not the most nimble on his feet, so running out to the perimeter can be tasking for him and he will get blown past. Even when attackers don't take Petkacin off the dribble, he can still be a non-factor contesting on the perimeter. Simply put, he needs to be able to get there faster or this will be a significant problem in the NBA. Another thing that often happens is Petkacin fouling on his closeouts. This is not just a technique issue, but a mobility issue. Petkacin gets sloppy because he has to rush out to contest the three. Instead, he ends up fouling and conceding really terrible fouls for his team. Petkacin can also get taken advantage of when he has to guard in space. Again, this goes back to how rigid he is as a defender. Petkacin is not mobile or flexible, so he is bound to be a target for shifty ball handlers and outside shooters. Teams in the Adriatic League constantly look to expose Petkacin on switches, so when the level of play goes up in the NBA, I expect the same thing to happen at a worse level. When Petkacin had to guard in space, he had a torrid time. Petkacin was constantly on his toes, unable to make things tough for guards, and constantly had threes splashed in his face. Watch here as this happens, but even when opponents missed, Petkacin was nowhere close enough to legitimately contest. I mentioned earlier that Petkacin's offensive versatility gives him a greater chance of success in the NBA, but his defense right now lacks that same dimension. If Petkacin cannot be asked to switch at the next level, which right now is the case in my opinion, then that will heavily condition what his team can do with him. In terms of the more traditional post defense that might be expected of a big, it's a mixed bag right now. Something that Petkacin struggles with is nuance. If the attacker can face up, drop the shoulder, or go reverse, then Petkacin does not possess the craft to deal with any of that. In terms of his overall defense, Petkacin is still pretty green, and while he probably won't have to contend with as many post-ups in the NBA, these concepts are still applicable. But if all Petkacin has to do down low is be physical, then he is well equipped to deal with that. Petkacin suffers when his attackers are more elaborate, but he can go head to head if what he has to do is bump down low. Petkacin's strength is one of his most NBA ready skills, so it's not that like he can really be pushed around or bullied. Petkacin can take contact, front the post to get steals, and make himself big down low. He has also shown some intelligence with his rotations and team defense. Petkacin cannot make a tangible difference as an individual defender right now in my opinion, but perhaps he will be able to offset that. It seems to me like Petkacin generally knows where he needs to be, but he cannot always get there. That means that he really needs to be one step ahead of everything. For an 18 year old, that is a lot to ask, but there are some signs which make me think that Petkacin can get there. For instance, here he keeps up with his man off the dribble and forces the tough shot at the end. Or in the next clip, he travels the width of the court to execute his closeout. Him doing this regularly is unlikely, but in my opinion, he's shown enough worth investing in. So the appeal with Rocco Petkacin starts on offense for me, and to be honest, I don't want to compare them as prospects, but I do think that the same sort of notion applies with him as it does with Evan Mobley, in that you're thinking, well, this is a big guy, 6'9", 220, who can move really well, he can handle the ball, he can pass both in transition and in the half court, he's shown enough juice off the dribble, you're intrigued by the package. But obviously where everything comes apart in that comparison is on the defensive end. Because Mobley can also do everything on that end of the floor, whereas Petkacin really cannot do much of anything right now that I see translating to an NBA level right off the bat. Yes, the flashes on offense are tantalizing with the touch, with the shot, with the pass. But what is that good for if Petkacin is going to give up points on D? In my opinion, Petkacin's lateral mobility is really worrying. He can't really close out, he can't recover in the pick and roll. I'm not sure that he's going to be able to play anything then drop right off the bat in the NBA. And of course, I could be wrong, but if that's the case for Alpert and Shengun, who in my opinion is a better lateral athlete than Petkacin, then I don't see why that would not happen. Regardless of my worries on the defensive side of the basketball though, I do think that Petkacin is worth a first round pick. The package is very intriguing and you're hoping that at some point everything comes together. 
If you have a team that you really trust to develop this guy, and you think that Petkacin can make strides both offensively in terms of putting everything together and defensively, mostly in terms of understanding because I do think the athleticism is limited, then why not pick him top 20, top 25? Either way, I do think that this is someone to closely monitor going forward, and given that he is one of the youngest guys in this year's draft class, I do think that maybe we are only seeing a very, very raw version of him. As always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like, make sure to leave a comment to tell me what you think of Rocco Petkacin, and if you enjoyed the channel, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you guys next time.